Welcome to the illustrious surrounds of the Astor Theatre for the 69th Melbourne International Film Festival. And we are really lucky today to be speaking to Sian Heder, the, the director of Apple's gorgeous film, Coda. And I just want to say that we are meeting here on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, the Boon Wurrung and the Wurundjeri people. And I want to pay my deepest respects to their elders, past and present. This land was never ceded. Shan, welcome to Melbourne. And, and about the, the closest that we can right now in, in this crazy world that we live in. I wish I was actually there. We wish as well, we wish. And, and especially to talk about this gorgeous film. I, I was really lucky, Shan, back in, the, back in the before time to travel to Paris and actually chat to the filmmakers behind La, La Famille Bellier which, you know, it's this beautiful film about a young hearing girl brought up in a deaf family with a, and she has a cracking singing voice. And then here, here we are all these many years later and you as a filmmaker get to reimagine this story uh, for, you know, in, in, in an American setting. What, what particular challenges does that present to you as a writer and director to... I guess, find, find a new life for this story and, and, and with a different lens. Well, I, I think it's always interesting when you're asked to do a remake of the film because sort of the question comes up of why, you know, it's, it's the story has been told, it was told well, it was told with great, you know, a great performance at the center of it. And I think when I, I just felt when I saw the original that it was so moving to me, the film was, you know, made me cry and, I, and I also felt like there was more to explore. You know, I felt like that the idea, the premise of being a coda, which is a child of deaf adults. So it's a hearing girl in a deaf family. And she's sort of trapped between two worlds of the hearing world and the deaf world. And, and I felt like there was just more to dig out and more to explore. And there was a way to really personalize the story and tell my own story as a filmmaker while using sort of all of the promise that was in the premise. And so I, you know, it's interesting to think about it because I think, you know, the movie was obviously a huge inspiration to me and a launching off pad, but I think it became so personal in the writing and then personal in where I said it and how I developed the characters and the family that it really became its own thing that became its separate film. And this is what really intrigues me and pe maybe people wouldn't immediately realize watching the film, but this is where you grew up. So this whole setting of um, Gloucestershire by the sea, this is your origin story really. So tell me about what this place means to you. <laughs> well, I came to the project. So I, the Lionsgate was originally a studio movie and Lionsgate had the rights to do the remake. and. And I had just been at Sundance with my film Tallulah. It was to 2016, I think, when I went in. And um, and they were looking for a filmmaker to come in with a take, you know, like what, how, how would you reinvent this as an American story? And I actually didn't grow up in Gloucester, Massachusetts. I grew up in Cambridge, which is, you know, about 45 minutes away. But I would come up here every summer as a kid. So I spent my summers here and I knew the place really well. And the town is this great mix of being kind of, quintessential New England, you know, with all the kind of picturesque coastline and rocky coastline. And then it's also got this really gritty working class vibe in the fishing industry and all the humor of kind of those working class, you know, fishing families. And so I just love the dichotomy of the place. And, and there was a lot of, there were many issues within the fishing community. So, you know, when I was a kid coming up here, there were 700 boats out in the harbor fishing, and now there's six. And part of it is that, you know, the family fishermen, all the regulations that have happened, which I believe in because I'm an environmentalist and I think we have to, you know, take care of the fisheries, but at the same time, corporations found a way to keep fishing and the family fisherman was really the person that got hit the most and struggled then those boats were the boats that couldn't go out anymore so it was a great conflict for a story and it was a great place in a community to set to set this story and I just love the idea of blending kind of all of the struggles that the fishing community was going through with kind of the more personal struggle of this deaf family in in an inaccessible hearing community and how they sort of crossed those made those bridges 
And it's really interesting. We don't want to spoil anything. I mean, I'm assuming people have watched the film if they're watching this Q&A, but it's really interesting how those stories cross over in a dr dramatic way. That Did that present lots of opportunity for you as a storyteller? Yeah, and there were just so many opportunities to kind of dig in. I mean, people talk about, you know, the authenticity of having to dig in, you know, with deaf culture and how to get that right and really surround myself with collaborators, you know, from the deaf community who had lived it, who could weigh in and make sure I was, you know, authentically portraying that community. But there was also a lot of pressure to authentically portray this fishing community. You know, they're very, you know, salt of the earth, like been out there for generations and don't love outsiders coming in. And so I really had to ingratiate myself. I had to go down to the fishing bars, you know, when I knew the boats were coming in and buy all those guys a beer and hope that one of them would start chatting to me and then take me out on his boat. So it was really a whole process to like get in with the fishing community, you know, and, and, and the authenticity is kind of a both worlds and making sure that I was holding space for both of those things. That's brilliant. And uh, yeah, I'd love to talk about all the work. You know, I mean, last year I was lucky to speak to Riz Ahmed about Sound of Metal and the incredible amount of work as a hearing person to settle into that role. And obviously you've got, you know, you've got incredible actor like Marie Matten here. The, tell me about working with deaf actors, casting deaf for the family and what that meant for you as a filmmaker to be able to work um, successfully with them. Well, I think, you know, if there was any fear going in, it was honestly that I really value that director actor connection, you know, and it's so important, such an intimate relationship where you there's so much trust involved, and your actors really have to, you know, put faith in you to guide their performance and communication is huge. So the idea that there were going to be interpreters on set and there was going to be somebody else in the middle of that relationship was a little bit intimidating to me because I thought, who is that person? You know, I know my actor, I know what they're capable of. I just don't know this person who's coming in and how are they, you know, what word are they, what sign are they choosing for that word that I use to direct that performance? And so it was an interesting, I'd been studying, I started studying ASL when I started writing the script so I wanted to have a basic facility with the language. And I knew that that was going to be a big part. You know, 40% of the script was in ASL. So it was important to me that I understood the language and could speak some. I was probably at like a, you know, eight-year-old level or wherever I was at. But once we started working, it was really clear to me on day one that I, it was very difficult to have another person in the middle of that relationship. And my actors would be looking at the interpreter and not looking at me. And so much of what I'm doing as a director is on my face. It's not necessarily the words I'm choosing. It's my expression. It's my, you know, the emotions that I'm conveying. So I went to my actors and I went to Marley and Troy and Daniel and just said, is it cool if we just, if I sign with you directly and half the time it's going to be crazy. I'm probably going to not know the sign and be making something up and you guys feel free to make fun of me, but I really want to have that direct connection with you and we'll have the interpreter right there. And, you know, if we need further clarification, they will jump in and we'll make sure that we are all on the same page, but I just want to make sure that we can just sign with each other directly. And they were like, yes, please. You know, everyone really wanted that. And so we did it and it was amazing. And I learned to sign really quickly. And, you know, sometimes I wasn't signing. Sometimes I was, you know, we were gesturing or I was sort of finding other ways to communicate with my body. And then we had wonderful interpreters who were there to kind of make sure that was happening. But I just formed a really close relationship with my actors and an amazing connection. And um, I'm so grateful kind of that everybody was on board to try this you know, experiment. And I feel like, you know, it wasn't the challenge that people that I thought it would be at the beginning. And in fact, sign language on set is a brilliant language because you can sign with somebody silently while the scene is going on. So suddenly, you know, we had Amelia and I would be on set, you know, on the fishing boats and she's on one boat and I'm on the other and we're two hearing people, but we're like, oh, it's easier to sign back and forth than use a walkie. You know, my AD and I were signing to each other and suddenly it sort of sign language took over and became the culture of our set. So camera operators were signing and, you know, it, it became a really cool kind of set language. And I was very grateful that we had a set so focused on communication. 
I mean, that, that just sounds wonderful. I mean, obviously there's a bit of, you know, you're in the trenches together making a film. Did that add an extra layer of community to the cast and crew, you know, communicating in this way? I think everyone had to break out of their boundaries. You know, I remember my camera operator the first day, one of them turning to me and saying like, how do I tell Troy to move over? And I'm like, well, what do you need him to, you know, he's like, well, I need him to like move over. I'm like, you have your body. You can reach out and touch his arm and you can, you can tap him. You can move him over. You guys have, there's a million ways we can communicate. And I think so often the things that are preventing people are embarrassment, or am I going to say the wrong thing? Or am I going to offend someone if I try? And we have all these tools at our disposal. You, you know, you could tell me a story right now, not knowing any sign language without saying a word, you could act it out. You could experience all the, you know, it's, and it's about getting over shyness. And so I think that was the beautiful thing is, you know, to watch this crew come together. And by the end of the shoot, we were just like this one amazing unit making this movie and no one was thinking about any of those things. And we'd all found a way to communicate and it was really lovely. And it just sort of made me feel like these boundaries that we have up between the hearing world and the deaf world. And it's, they could all be easily bridged, you know, if people were a little bit braver and a little bit, you know, less self-conscious, I guess. Absolutely. And, and, you know, speaking of shyness and self-consciousness, that's probably a good bridge to talk about casting the incredible Amelia Jones, who, you know, you obviously need to have someone who can be at the end of the film, a very confident, you know, bold singer. But then you have to also deprogram that and have her as this person who is only just getting over being bullied at school and feeling like she's able to, to, to you know, reach out and do something like that. So t yeah, talk to me about casting Amelia and, and, and going on that journey with her. Well, Amelia is interesting because she has this incredible voice, but she is untrained and she did not consider herself a singer. And so I, you would think that I would have had to untrain, you know, sort of take this incredibly confident person and untrain them, but in fact, I found in Amelia, you know, she was 17 when we shot the movie. I don't think Amelia knew the talent that she was. I don't think she was aware of what her voice could do. And I remember casting her and she was like, I'm not really a singer. And so she had all of the kind of what the character had, which was this really raw talent without the kind of, you know, polished skill set of I've been doing this, you know, I've been working with vocal coaches my whole life and I know how to do this. So and it was really important to me to capture live performance on set. Like we didn't pre-record any of it. You know, we were working to capture it live because she was discovering her voice as we were shooting. So she was having these kind of breakout moments on camera that were actually the actress kind of discovering, like, I didn't know I could hit that note. Like, I didn't know that could come out of me. So it was really cool, actually. And she was very game and brave. And, you know, she did so much for this film. It's like, you know, she had to sing. She was, you know, she studied ASL for nine months to get up to speed and look like a fluent signer. She went out on fishing boats. So did Troy and Daniel. They were going out at 3 a.m., in rehearsal with these local fishermen out, you know, three to five miles out to sea and learning how to gut cod and run the boat. And, you know, she was just amazing. I mean, she's, she was this incredible, had this work ethic and this talent. And, you know, I mean, we were there, we were jumping off 50 foot cliffs and Amelia's like, I want to jump. And I'm like, you can't jump. <laughs> we're a stunt devil is going to jump. She's like, but I want to jump. And I'm like, you can't, you can't. We need you tomorrow if something <laughs> happens. So she was just a very game, you know, really fun person to work with. And I think she delivered such an incredible performance. And, you know, you, you mentioned how important it was that she looked like a fluent signer, but also she has to look like she is that person, you know, that family dynamic really has to work for this film to sing and it does. So, I mean, I, I, I love all of the, the cheeky humor in it as well. You know, I mean, the, the jock itch scene is spectacular. <laughs> and the horror of, you know, being a teenager and having to describe 
your parents' sexual health is just the worst nightmare you can just about imagine. <laughs> Talk to me about, about that element of the film. Well, I, you know, it was really important to me that these characters, I came from kind of outrageous parents. My parents are both artists, you know, they're totally out of line. They swore, you know, my daughter now is like, do all grandmas say the F word as much as my grandma? And I'm like, no, they don't. This is, you know, this is how I grew up. But so my parents were always very open about sex. They were not, they had no self-consciousness around my friends. They were, you know, and I spent my childhood kind of mortified and delighted by it. It's like what I'm delighted by as an adult, I was sort of mortified as a teenager. And so I think in thinking about this family, I sort of drew from my own family, which was very tight and loving and, but maybe a little enmeshed and slightly boundaryless and, you know, got to kind of explore that idea that I had had, you know, with these characters. And yes, it's made all the more mortifying because she is the interpreter for her parents in these situations. So not only does she have to, you know, the last thing you want to think about is your parents having, you know, jock itch, <laughs> having to go to the doctor, but having to be in the middle of that conversation. And Troy Kotzer is one of the funniest people ever. He plays the father and he's hilarious and his signing is hilarious and he just had us all laughing on set I mean every time he would do those scenes it was more outrageous and crazier and more visual and finally it would be like no no that's too far like we have to take it back but he was wonderful and he was an incredible improviser and so I think those scenes were a lot of fun to shoot because he was also just enjoying you know embarrassing his daughter as much as we were enjoying watching it. And he and Marley have just fantastic chemistry as well. And I suppose that's really important for the film to, to make it work too. Well, one of the beautiful stories around that is that, you know, Troy was growing up as a deaf kid who didn't, you know, was interested in acting, but didn't really have any model of what that could be. And, you know, Marley, Children of a Lesser God came out and Marley, I think was 19 when she was in that movie and Troy saw the movie and it was really the thing that made him feel like, oh, I can be an actor. Like, this is something that I could do with my life. And so she was this huge inspiration to him, I think, in even imagining this career for himself. And so Troy's been an actor, you know, he's a he's a very known stage actor. He was part of Deaf West Theater Company and he's been on Broadway and he's, you know, done a lot of theater, but this was really, you know, a, a big role for him and to step in and, and be married to Marley Matlin. And, you know, they had a relationship already. And I was lucky that a lot of the actors knew each other. So Troy had played Daniel's father before um, in a show. And so there was a chemistry there and a kind of history there that was really, I think, wonderful in creating that on-screen chemistry. And also we just became a family. I mean, we really did. I've never had an experience like that on a project where we were and I've worked with great actors and I've, I've had the intense set experience, but not really where you feel like, oh, I can't leave these people like they actually are my family. Part of the drama of the film is, you know, Ruby's kind of dilemma of does she pursue her dream? And when, when she realizes that singing is something that brings her so much joy, can she leave a family that she feels is fully dependent on her? And Eugenio having to kind of, his character having to kind of navigate that bridge with her as well. I mean, I love his character also because, you know, yes, Ruby is sort of like, you know, using her family in a way as an excuse too, right? It's, you know, oh, they need me. I can't leave. They're putting this on me. And he sort of calls her on her chit a bit, you know, he's like, well, you're afraid to do that. You know, I mean, he's, he's, and I think I think the best teachers in my life were always people that kind of saw through the ways I was holding myself back. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about that relationship is that it's easy for Ruby to, you know, fall back on, oh, well, my family relies on me. And her brother calls her out on it. You know, her brother's like, go. Like, we were fine before you, we'll be fine after you, like, get out of here. And to have this teacher that believes in her and sees through that and is like, you know what, this is your thing. Like, you're afraid of who you're going to be. And I love that moment where she says, you know, towards the end of the film, I've never done anything without my family. 
she doesn't say they've never done anything without me. She sort of says, well, I'm afraid of this because I don't know how to be in the world without them. And I think it's a big flip because it's easy to interpret the film as, you know, we'll hear her deaf parents relying on their hearing daughter when I think their hearing daughter is getting a lot of self-confidence and self-worth off of having that important role in the family. And it's hard for her to see an identity for herself outside of that. So it's sort of a two-way street. And I liked playing with that tension where, you know, it can flip. The scene with her brother is really beautiful. It really is. I love that moment when he pushes her, like, you know, the, the mama bird pushing out the nest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it was a really important scene for me in the film because you know, he's another generation and he's not dependent on her and he's fully independent. And actually he's frustrated with his parents for being codependent in that way. It's like, you've fallen into this bad habit and why don't you look to me? I can do this for you, you know? And so I think it was important for me that, you know, also with the deaf characters that there are so many tropes, I think around, you know, characters with deaf characters or characters with disability, where it's sort of, to show that there are all these individual journeys and everybody has their own path. And Leo as a character is totally annoyed with his parents and this like dynamic that they've established with his sister. And it sort of has to like shift everybody out of this, these habits that they've been in. Sean, I'm almost gonna bring it full circle again. We, we started this interview speaking about the world we live in now. And of course, Koda, came out into a world very different than when you started filming. You know, you have this incredible success at Sundance. Apple loved the film, but it was also a very different Sundance than you had possibly hoped for. That, talk to me about the dual emotions of how well Coda has done, but it not quite getting the birth that perhaps you might have wanted. Yeah. I mean, I was laughing the other day. It's like the Sundance that every filmmaker would dream of having, but then I didn't get to have it. You know, it was like, I was at home with my five-year-old and my seven-year-old and my husband was sitting on the couch. and was like, okay, we'll press play. I hope people are watching. Um, but I think they actually did a kind of amazing job this year because they did the, as a festival, they managed to create an energy. Like there really was a feeling and an, an excitement and an energy to the festival. And one of the beautiful things that came out of it for me is it kind of democratized Sundance. It's like Sundance has always been this exclusive, you know, we're up in Park City, we can afford a condo to be here and we get to be in the in crowd and go to the parties and see the movies. And there was just something so cool about like my parents' friends watched, got to go to Sundance and the fisherman, the captain whose boat we used, Paul Vitale, he and his whole Italian family in Gloucester sat down to watch the movie. And so in a way like Sundance became for everybody. And I think that was a really cool thing. And I think they felt it as a festival and it's like, oh, well, we can't quite go back to what we were because this is a really magical thing to kind of have it be accessible, you know, and open to the world. So. There were amazing things I think about the way that that happened. And also, you know, we had just been trapped in our homes for an entire year. And I, in a way, thematically, the movie is about this four person family that's just in this little warm bubble where their whole world they've built together. And there was just something about, I had been in that bubble with my own family for a year. You know, I have two kids and my husband and we'd just been in the trenches with our kids and didn't see anybody else. And it was just this thing. So in a way it felt kind of perfect. It's like, well, I was telling a story about family and what better way to experience this, this than with my family, you know, in our little own womb-like bubble that we've been in for a year. So it was cool. I mean, it was definitely after we did the q and A. I I went in to like read my daughter a story and I looked down at my phone and I had 200 and something text messages. And I remember my seven-year-old was like, stop looking at your phone, like put your phone away. And I was like, this is the only way I can experience Sunday. <laughs> my phone was like, okay. And like turn my phone off and just kind of like waited an hour till they were asleep and then went back in. But so it's very humbling. All of, you know, it was like, there was no, you know, feeling the buzz at your own after party it was it was a very different experience but it was memorable and I'm so grateful for it that's such a beautiful story to end on Shan it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today thank you so much and I truly you know I can't wait to watch this movie with an audience in a theater I still haven't had that experience yet so hopefully soon and I'm so grateful that 
everyone who did watch it got to have that. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Brilliant, beautiful film. All right. Thank you.